Good, good, good. Yeah, you have me stressed. Like, I was ringing up your phone. I'm, I hadn't just heard from you for a little while, and it's getting to, like, 10-2. I was thinking, where is he? What's going on? Uh, and then, and, um, yeah, obviously, yeah. What, what were you doing? You were coaching? or? Yeah, so I was, I was coaching the team that um, – it's a university football team that – and they'll have a tournament next Saturday. So I just came to – I'm in Canterbury right now, and then okay. I'm taking – after so it was the final session sacrificed man united versus liverpool for it i don't know what i've missed but i'm going to have to catch up <laughs> yeah yeah well well um hold, hold that for a minute because um the team like when we upload these episodes onto our youtube channel that's where most people watch oh, these okay. yeah so so like we get like good amount of views on our youtube channel once we upload them and then obviously on spotify and then the editors have kind of pulled me up a little bit. They've said, Sean, you, you guys just get straight into it. And then you just start talking. And then there's not necessarily like um, much explanation for people to understand, like, you know, um, yeah, what these podcasts are, like what we're trying to do. So, so before, so, so I'll introduce you. Um, I've got to do, go through this process now. So, so yeah, Project Footballer is the voice of youth football. Um, that's that's what we're doing. Um, ultimately, it started out like two years ago with like friends of mine. Um, we we we've coached for a long time. Um, been involved in like professional football. We've had a lot of the kids that we've been involved with like um, got signed at academies, or um, some of them now even like play in Premier League. Like Harvey Elliott, who scored today, he's one of the kids who who I was involved with scouting and coaching and then seeing them go through. So yeah, loads and loads of these examples. So then you're starting to say, we're seeing it so much. Like, is there a formula to it? Like, you know, is there a way that you could literally create this blueprint to say, this is how you get your kids signed to an academy and this is how you get them to become a pro footballer. Very much a thought experiment, not necessarily like having an answer, but through the conversations we're like right let's have these conversations on camera and so if people went back to like episode one episode two of project footballer they would see that sort of like early inception of the idea and then it's then just like expanded out you know then we've then been able to like interview footballers through contacts we've had and experts in football and just keep expanding the conversation all the time and then this is where it's become this this voice of youth football so yeah you know that that's it that's what project footballer is um I, you know we've we've connected raf um we've connected probably over the last sort of like three four weeks i would say i'm not might have been a bit longer than that but like i've just been a huge fan of yours like your videos are incredible like um and, and like you've obviously grown like a massive massive audience um like I, I've, I've, like I said, I've worked with a lot of people that like are high up in football who are like, yeah, all these footballers. Um, your knowledge is crazy. Like your knowledge is so, so high. Um, so, so yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you could just maybe just talk a little bit about yourself, if that's all right, you know, how, how have you developed this knowledge of football that's so strong and so high? Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. I just think it's, from a young age, I've always been watching football, so I never really, you know, enjoyed playing video games and, and I didn't really go down that route. So in my spare time when I wasn't in primary school, I would either be playing and I've played at like Wickham Wanderers and Barnet Academy. Yeah. So I always had a very good level of coaching from a young age. And then I would be watching like prime Barcelona or I'll be watching, you know, prime Man United in 2008. And then for some reason, I just liked connecting the dots between... Cause I played a lot of chess when I was younger as well. And I just think I found a link between thinking ahead, doing your due diligence before, and then making moves in the, on the pitch and seeing that it works. And um, especially when I was watching Barcelona with, with Guardiola, that was a big, big sort of football education. And that video I made recently, I said, it's, it's football education. So, so I studied that. I tried it out on the pitch in my Sunday league games as well. And then I would help out my teammates. I would say, look, I'm going to do a one-two with you. Then you do this and that. And then I just felt like it, it was sort of fun to experiment and see that ideas actually worked. And, mm. and just as I got older and older, I would be on the way to my games thinking, hopefully the coach plays this lineup and plays me in this way so I can do this. 
And then when it does, and then obviously the coach has a different idea maybe. And then I come on the way back home thinking, what if, you know, we try that idea? So it's just mm. that, that experimentation, that sort of idea, like, let me try this, let me try that, let me experiment. And then when I watch games, I identify the feeling that players get. So when I spoke about La, La Pausa, for example, which we'll get into later on, I'm, I'm just trying to think about the feeling aspect more than just, okay, he's doing this. What is the player feeling in that moment? Mm. And then I can remember it because I've played a lot of football at various different levels, in different team environments, under different coaches. So I just think my upbringing in the footballing world has helped me massively. And I owe it to all my previous coaches that have given me so many different, uh, so, so, so much variety in tactics and ideas and understanding. That's really sort of helped me. How old are you? I am 22. 22, yeah. Yeah, so in the football world, like in terms of coaching, like you're very young. Yeah. Um, you, you said that you got into coaching literally only in July last yes. year? Yes. Yeah, so that's what I find nuts. Um, the way that you are on your videos and like, you know, for anyone that's like listening to this or watching this now um, and doesn't know Coach Raf, like you've got to get onto his Instagram. You've just got to watch tons of his videos just watch them and you'll learn from them like like i've worked in football like 20 years and like i said like literally i spent time with uh, i'm so careful to n name drop i don't want to name drop <laughs> but i feel like I, I have to to kind of like give you your flowers and your respect um but like yeah man like you know if i if i've like spent time like talking to gareth southgate or like Flora Maluda or Emma Hayes or like the time with like spending with like Redknapp or heads of recruitment, like all these football people, like constant, but your football knowledge is, is insane. Like it proper, proper is so high. Um, so yeah, like, um, uh, yeah, I want to, I want people to understand that. Yeah. Like, cause, cause I think like with football, there is nepotism in football sometimes people can be, have jobs that are high up in football but it doesn't mean that they have purely got there on ability so there can be like brilliant people that are working outside the professional game but it just it, just because they haven't got into the professional game doesn't mean that they aren't unbelievable and like i kind of get that feeling from yourself you know like um yeah I, I, i'll give you those levels um obviously to be able to do stuff on social media and be able to analyze tactics and so on that's different from actually being able to implement it to exactly. real people exactly. so so you know that's obviously going to be your challenge but in terms of like the knowledge like yeah it's, it's there um and, I, and i'd just be interested to ask you because it comes across in your videos that you must watch football all the time like are you just watching games like literally like three or four games a day uh i mean not three or four games a day but you know, in, in the summertime, especially when I was getting into coaching, I was thinking, OK, when I'm coaching this newly formed team, you know, I literally held open trials in a local park and just everyone came. Like we had 50 trialists and I would have to trim it down. That was in the evening. But during the day, I would say, OK, what play style do I want? Let me really study Brighton. Let me watch Brighton versus, I don't know, Aston Villa last season. Why are Brighton doing this? And then what I would do is I would ask myself questions and then the more I ask myself questions, the more ideas I got. Because I've played a lot of football, it's like, okay, so why is, I don't know, Lewis Dunk from Brighton holding the ball? What's he trying to do? Okay, why is Caicedo, like, and then I'll really get into the details, intricate details. And, you know, over time, let's say I, I give myself a target five full matches a week. Um, recently, I haven't watched a lot of games. I've been very busy, but I, I do full match replays. So, like, Man United Liverpool, I'll watch, like, tomorrow morning, for example, just to see what's happening. Um, but yeah, like my education, a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you learn a lot about football? I just, I just watch football and I ask myself questions and mm. that's literally, the more you ask, mm. the more you ask, why is the left back, you know, not tracked back in this instance? Oh, because this, this, and then you just develop little connections. And then over time, it just builds like a, a cobweb of ideas in, in your mind. E yeah, but then there must be something, and this is where we get into like nature and nurture, and we talk about nature and nurture with footballers. I'm also interested in like other aspects of where things are nature and nurture, and oh. there must be something that in your brain you're able to map things out in a very, very unique way. I mean, you spoke earlier, referenced like playing chess, 
Um, but I also play a lot of chess. I, I'd be up for having a game. Like you're, you sound like yeah, you'll probably like give me a battering. But um, yeah, like like I think I think there are people who are able to create pictures in their mind and hold knowledge in a very like unique way, and and that's something that some people maybe like yeah, maybe it's hardwired in them. I don't know, but it seems that, that you have that ability. Um, so combined with like your passion for, for studying football from like seeking out information, you're also able to connect dots in a very, very unique way. And that does come through in your videos. Um, so, so, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. So, so just with the nature nurture, that's very interesting that you mentioned that. I'm just thinking it might be more to do with nurture because when I was seven years old, starting off in Sunday league football up to the age of 19, I have played every position on the pitch except for goalkeeper and I think that helped me a lot because you know every position is a different angle different perspective mm. so when I would play like 10 games at left back then 15 games at centre back then centre midfield for two years then left winger for three years then striker so all of these positions I think have given me that once again I go back to feeling I, I sort of know what the player is feeling on the pitch because I've played in most of the positions I think that's why to, to answer that question about hardwired, I would say it's more my nurture from my upbringing in the footballing world more than something in my okay. mind. Uh, I would okay. say more towards that spectrum. Uh, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just, it's uncommon for me to speak to someone who is able to reel off just the amount of players' names that, uh, that you talk about. And even when you're in your videos, you're talking up you're seeing patterns on the pitch with what you describe and the different shapes and again it's very very unique way of speaking about oh, football yeah 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 exactly so so that's what i mean you know that that's what i've sort of like noticed which is very unique about you but okay um i, I think yeah hopefully people have got a good understanding of you know um you as as, a, as a, an important person that they need to listen to and take information from um what i want to discuss <laughs> in tonight's episode i i I want us to think about and hear from you in the, the way that football is going, the future of football. I, I want to hear about that. And then what, once we then kind of like get these ideas of where football could be in 10 years time, we can then try to then loop it back to today and think about what parents can do to help give their children the best chance of being able to play in this future game in 10 years time. So I want us to think about where there are ceilings, you know, have we hit athletic ceilings? Have we hit technical ceilings? Is there more space to develop psychologically? Is there, is there more space to develop or from the social side of the game, you know, and then how do we go about doing this and how, what can parents do? So this is really what I want to get into today, but Raf, where do you think the game is going to be in 10 years time? In 10 years time, I would say every player on the pitch would be playing a position, but they would be equally effective in their natural position, playing somewhere else as well. So a right back would be able to play left wing, centre mid comfortably. A centre back could play striker even, and a striker could potentially play, let's say, left back if he's left footed. I can... I can see it leaning towards that way with the way it's going in 10, 15 years, certainly. Yeah. Because at seven years old, eight years old, the training with the little kids now, the <laughs> demands on footballers around the world are that you have to be good enough with your with left foot as well as right foot. So the, the only the ones that get signed to academies at top academies have those abilities, which then by the time they get to the top end, all the, all the players that the managers are working with are comfortable off both feet. Yeah, so they can both, play on left side, play on right side. Both feet, back to goal proficiency, uh, play in front. So some centre midfielders like to play in front of them because they, they panic if there's someone behind them. But it will get to the stage where you just don't care where you are on the pitch. And it's, it's about, you know, playing, playing the conditions, playing the game, playing what you see, playing, you know interesting passes i think it's really going in that way and every mm. player would do that not just oh let's give it to the number 10 let him do it it would be like everyone so like i think here in that it's not just technical ability that <clears throat> needs to be there just in terms of like right i have the ability to dribble with my left and pass with my left as well as my right 
you're also needing to really develop the player's game understanding and positional understanding from a young age. Because yeah. if, the, if they're going to go and have to have that ability, it's probably meant that at the young ages, that education has started. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's literally introducing the tactics as soon as they're able to pass comfortably and play comfortably. That's when you introduce, okay, movements, off the ball movements, thinking two steps ahead, making a run for no reason. It seems like it's no reason, but you'll get the ball on like the fourth or fifth pass. I think yeah. when it starts at that young age, it'll really, you know, develop. Like we, we spoke about Inter Milan, how they bring the centre midfielders back and the defenders were, yeah. Well, well, hang on. We spoke about it, but the audience don't know. They might not know what you're talking about. So let's break that down, like really break that down. For, and we have a lot of parents that listen to us. So try and speak in layman's terms as best as possible. Okay. So Inter Milan, they play three centre-backs, five across the middle, two wing-backs with three centre midfielders and two strikers. But against Atletico Madrid in the first game, there was a moment of uh, play where the three centre midfielders had dropped back to the back three and the back three had gone into the middle. So if you're looking from row Z, you're looking, the three centre midfielders are in front of the keeper and the three centre backs are in the middle. And it's like, what's going on? And, and the reason is, Inzaghi, the manager of Inter Milan, saw that my best players on the ball, if I want to keep the ball in a Champions League game, tough game, are my midfielders. If we can keep the ball as much as possible, we will dominate the game. Where can I keep the ball a lot? Round the back. Who are my most proficient players under pressure? It's my three midfielders. So let's bring them back. Our three defenders are able to head the ball and chest it down. So if we do go long, at least they're there to control or head it for a little flick on and we can play from there. And I think that really showed a completely different style of football. Seeing that, like, it's so unorthodox. It's, and what's interesting is when England under 21, correct me if I'm wrong, did they win the World Cup or Euros very recently? Euros. Euros. If you saw their formation, it was 4-4-2 and the two pivots were Curtis Jones and Angel Gomez, right? So they're, two, they're the only two centre midfielders, but they're not the orthodox CDMs or CMs. They're, they're more attacking midfielders, little half wingers, and they were playing in the pivot role. And if you saw the way they played, it was amazing. They, they didn't lose the ball. They would get the ball like from their goalkeeper, turn, play little passes. And I, I've made that link. I made that link on the way here. I was thinking, wait, so even England under 21s, they've started that to bring their most proficient players like their attack-minded playmakers, and just put them deep as deep as possible, so they can really retain the ball. Uh, like I'm, I'm thinking back to the game that you're talking about, and didn't they play Spain in the final? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Spain, obviously, they are so possession dominant. They did still dominate with possession. Like England, like they had in that, they had Anthony Gordon as striker, and I remember watching it and. We did still, even despite what you're describing, we did still play in transition quite a bit, you know, and it was kind of like more without possession, um, like trying to find like Gordon in behind. But I feel that if we didn't do what you're describing and, and we wouldn't have been able to compete at all in terms of possession. And that has been like England's problems in the past where against the top sides, we just haven't been able to have the ball and they've just, the, the, the best teams have always just dominated us by so much. So we're seeing that with a change of philosophy and a change of attitude, England have been able to compete much better in these major tournaments in recent years. Exactly. And, and once again, England getting to the final and I'm talking about the lead up to the final. I saw some phases of play and they were just like blitzing teams from the goal kick like four, five, six intricate passes and they were mm. through. And mm. it, I was playing player profiles, Curtis Jones, two plays that you wouldn't trust just to play as a double pivot. Yeah. And they were playing. I think that, that sparked something very interesting. And then seeing Inter Milan do it on the bigger stage was really, really interesting for me personally. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't get to watch a huge amount of European football. So, like, with your video... I had no idea that Inter Milan were, were using tactics like this. 
uh, it's interesting because today then in the Man United game, Bruno Fernandes, he got a bit injured. So he played at centre-back for a lot of the end of the game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Back. Oh. Yeah. And it's nuts because Lee Dixon, he was going mental. Like, I find Lee Dixon's quite an old school guy. And, and, and yeah, and I've often seen it in the past with like commentators. And commentators don't realise that they're affecting the football culture with the way that they speak yeah, yeah they 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 a lot of the fans are very passive in what they when they listen to commentators they don't ask questions a lot of fans and th they they just consume what's being pushed down to them and and like you know i've i've had it in the past with like england where we were playing across our back line and uh, the commentators were saying oh you know they're not they're getting the ball forward. They've got to get it forward, you know, and they were in a rush to do it. So then that passes through to all the fans. And then the fans are saying, yeah, football needs to be direct. And then they then pass it down to their kids. And then the kids go yeah. out to grassroots and they play that way. It has this knock on effect. This is why like our company is called We Make Footballers. And the sort of thing behind that is that trying to get people to recognize that the environment creates the footballers. Um, uh, and, and, but we can change the environment. Um, so, so I've I've kind of gone on some tangents there, but but it was interesting. Yeah, I wanted to pull back to that R R Fernandez thing because that's where it, if he'd had that sort of tactical understanding to say no, 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 this is actually starting to happen a bit more. He he could have then like created the link. He could have said, oh yeah, you know, the other day Inter Milan did it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And, and 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 Rob Ursel, who's done quite a lot of podcasts with us. Um, and he's someone I really respect and, you know, he's got such a good football knowledge. Like years and years and years ago, he said that there's going to be far more rotations. He's like played a really high level of futsal. And so he says that, you know, in futsal, it's obviously super common that these rotations are always happening. And he then felt that this will happen more and more at the top level. And um, he got kind of chastised when he said this like 10 years ago. But like you're, you're saying it, it, it's it's happening you know that everyone's being expected to play in like multiple positions and during different moments managers will start to maybe even a bit like nfl you know that that you're saying that all right we want to build an attack let's put our players who are most competent on the ball into the position to build the attack just because they're not needed in this moment um high up the pitch we can start them here and then we can then rotate and then wait for the next moment to get them into different positions. I mean, is that what you're kind of like saying is going to happen? 100%. And um, have you heard of uh, Mark White from Dorking? No. So, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The guy who's got no badges. Yeah. But he's funny. Yeah. Like, he's a funny guy. Yeah. So um, I, I've watched his documentary very closely. And in pre-season, when he was giving his tactical talks, he said, modern football is in the format where the lineup that you see that's out of possession only so you know if you're playing four five one whatever out of possession that's your position in possession he, he the way he phrased it he said you need to go where you think you'll be most effective within that given moment and i think he summed up and he's in a uh, national league so he's, he's not even a professional like talking aren't fully professional and to see that at that level is very very refreshing and mm. do i think it's like a trickle effect more teams would more teams adopt it? I don't think you know the English football period is at that stage yet, where they can, they can really go down that philosophy. Okay, out of possession, we're four four two. In possession, centre back. If you see a space, go to see what happens. Like, like yeah. I don't there yet. However, in Spain, Italy, Germany, I can't speak from experience because obviously I haven't been there. But I would say there is that element where they are more progressive. They're more open to that idea. That's how mm. I would think about that. Linking this to coaching, because I have quite a few debates with people, like, for instance, Paul Merson, he really wants his boy to just play in one position. He thinks that he's got a master playing centre midfield. He's nine years old. He's, not, he's, not, he's nine years old at the moment with Chelsea Academy. And he says, like, I, I just want him to, like, master that. And the, the, the kind of, like, what the school of thought is, is that children at young ages do need to ro rotate positions so that they get an understanding of get a whole football education. And then, you know, like Rude Hullet talked about it recently where he was saying like this example of like, you know, what can classic happen is that a right winger will be going down the wing, 
cross the ball, the goalkeeper catches it, then they start a transition attack. And sorry, sorry, the right back does that. It, it should be that the right winger just naturally just goes in at full back to defend so while the right back gets their breath back. So like that mm. is kind of like the idea of total football. Um, and yeah, I, I think if we aspire towards total football, it's like, how, how do we get there? Because yeah. ch children do need, I can kind of see in my little kids game today, I was rotating positions a lot and it really, really disrupted the game, disrupted the full performance. And I want to give them those opportunities to learn, but also like it's suddenly everything broke down and then it's almost like impacting the development too much. So as a coach, I'm quite torn. I, I don't know if you ha what opinions you've got on this, on like, you know, when a child should move and rotate positions and when they need to just stick and learn. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good question. And, and this is, you've raised a very good sort of, uh, it's a very good problem to have, to, to solve. Because once you br go over this line, you, you potentially crack the code in having that total football. I just think when the child is five or six years old, you could sort of not introduce them to positions. Like, don't label that position. Just say, you are playing here, you are playing there, and just try and help each other out. Like, try and phrase it in a way where they don't think they're confined to that position. And then you say, out of possession, this is where you stand because of this reason. In possession, don't all run to the ball. That's where you can embed some tactical bits. But if you label the position, obviously a six-year-old will say, oh, like in, my, in the academy that I coach, always six-year-olds, when we do the training match, oh, can I go striker? Can I go striker? Can I go centre-back? And then when I say, you're going defender, they start moaning and groaning. And that's where you're thinking, wow, so def being a defender has a negative stigma and a striker has a positive stigma, but we're all part of the same team. Mm. So uh, labelling positions, perhaps th th that's one way of going. I, I wish Johan Cruyff was alive, so we could have potentially asked him something. Mm. Um, but, but I think th that's something very important. I, I think that, that's really good advice that you've mentioned there. I think like more and more parents and coaches need to introduce the idea of in possession and out of possession as early as possible. What I've discovered in recent years is a good way of teaching that is doing it through the imagery of colours. Okay. So, yeah, so when I describe, I don't always do it, but when I'm introducing this idea, I'll say, guys, out of possession, I want you to think red, I want you to think danger, I want you to think urgency. Yeah, get the colour red in your mind because they need to think of an on-off switch. They need to realise, right, you know, because there's a whole new shape happening. There's a, a different mindset, um, a different energy and emotion. So we're red, right, we're, we're going into this formation, right, we're defensive mode, we're getting back behind the ball. I was teaching the kids the word, the, the phrase, back behind the ball today. So, so, so yeah, so when parents are talking to their children, it would be good, I think, if they did say, out of possession. You in, in out of possession, keep almost like using that phrase all the time. So then children can like categorize that and think of like that moment. And then you can then say, when you were in possession, and in possession doesn't have to mean that the child was in possession and they were touching the ball. It can obviously mean in possession, your team is in possession. So how are you affecting the game? Well, when the switch went green, we say green for in possession. And now, now yeah, what are you doing? And I, I think, yeah, that would be some good advice for, I think, co you know, coaches that are working with young teams and obviously parents to, to use in their communication. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Ralph. Yeah, absolutely. But then that's where you've got to think, OK, what type of coaches like in terms of the ideologies of the majority of coaches in academies, what ideology do they have? So you mentioned, was it QPR that don't care about results and they just play different positions? Or was that Ch QPR? Yeah, it's QPR, yeah. QPR, uh, QPR really, um, yeah, they're heavily focused on just don't worry about results. Don't, it's kind of that vibe, yeah. So, so that's the thing, like all of the coaches around the academy level have to buy into that philosophy and say, look, I don't care about my win record. It's about my win record is having my players comfortable in all areas of the pitch. And mm. then knowing that once we hit under 16s, under 17s, that's when 
you know, that's when we'll see a proper brand of football. Yeah, but there's not winning and there's actually like harming the player's development. But because because if you're literally just doing like three or four positions in one game, it 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 could actually just yeah, be just so disruptive. Your team aren't stringing any passes together, your team are all disjointed and th and then everyone's suffering. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like, I'm kind of thinking that, right, it has to be really planned out. Like, it's like, okay, you have now perfected this position, exactly. you know, the, the, the left wing position. Um, we, we've got like, Raheem Sterling's little boys playing in our team now. And um, he, he's like, I, I can see from his like athletic profile, he's going to be, a, a, he's going to be a winger. I'm sure of it. Um, but I wouldn't want to, you don't want to pigeonhole players too early, but you can kind of still see a lot based a lot off their like athletic profile. Often that can determine it. So anyway, so he had a go centre midfield today and yeah, I, I know I need to get him time playing centre midfield so he can learn to do that. But it's like, I, I still need to to get him perfected in maybe some of the other positions. So it's like raising his confidence, making sure his confidence is super high. And, and then we can then do that change and give him that opportunity. But then I also then have to maybe keep some of the other kids in their most comfortable yeah. positions while I deal with that experiment. And, and, and it's like, yes, yeah, as a coach, it's like, how do you get those rotations right for, for everyone to develop? It's hard. Um and that's where it goes back to saying, okay, what age can we like draw the line and say, up to this age, they have position so they can develop enough ball security, you know, th they can really iron out the fundamentals. So then, then I can focus on, okay, rotation, you pass the ball overlap, don't forget, like forget about your position, someone else will fill it up. It's like, do we do at eight, nine, 10 years old? Like, what's the line? And that's a very difficult question to mm. find the answer to. Or, 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 do, or do we say, okay, let's just see how it it goes and then mm. the more the more they'll learn we'll just learn in a very scruffy way so <laughs> you know so, so i mean like in terms of like what we we're talking about there with the way that you see the game going with just so much fluidity and adaption with positions I, immediately i'm saying like the left and right footed thing this is an easy easy thing with like technique but then we then like said okay well game understanding um you know the players need to be able to have high levels of game understanding yeah. to be able to understand what to do in the different situations and play those different roles. So yeah, we're then saying that, right, okay, well then that then is, is it potentially affecting how we coach at young ages because we need to start introducing this stuff. It's not, it's not just, all right, you're going to go and play left midfield and that's it. I think some of the coaching sessions have to adapt to, to 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 teach this at an earlier age absolutely and, and that's why in, in the teams that i coach at the moment when we do p d training it's all possession drills with no direction and that's really? when yeah, what and age that's do you coach men's so this university team they're, they're men oh uh, uh, yeah but the, but okay so men is different like you know that's so so the the kind of the way that the philosophy of teaching that is like put down from the fa in the most simplest form, it's like from a young ages, get familiar okay. on the ball. It's like just just play, just just touch the ball, like master that. And then we don't really. What's meant to happen is you don't really worry about game understanding or tactics really at the young ages. It's like, and I can can see that. But the thing is, the kids are like playing football since they've been like four years old, like doing all this training. They're getting so good on the ball. They, they then are now capable to actually start learning some of this stuff. And the clubs are knowing that players need to have like better game understanding. So it's kind of like pushing the demands down the chain. So, okay. yeah, any, anyway, like, so it would be, like, so I think, I feel that's a change that's starting to happen in academy football and, and football now. Um, I, I think that, but, but like, it's, it's not, it's not being pushed down necessarily like this is kind of like a thing that's bubbling and happening kind of at grassroots level, but it's not necessarily being communicated and it's not coming through in the coaching badges. Right. So, so once again, I would still sort of say even at 
six, seven years old, you know, you, you do the ball mastery drills and then you do a possession drill with no direction. So then players just think about passing and moving into space because then that total football philosophy is pass and move into space. Yes, okay, there's a goal here. I need to go there. But when you break it down into f f uh, defensive third, middle third, attacking third, it's just pass and find a space. And doing a, and that's why I like five-a-side football in Brazil, like on the streets, when you see so many young Brazilians, you know, playing all day long on the streets. Yes, there's a direction, but there's no boundaries. They, they just develop so much comfort on the ball against opposition and there's no positions as well. I, I think that that's basically total football and how you could embed it. But once again, as we said, it's like the comfort of the ball needs to be prioritised before you mm. even... That's like, I can understand the FA's priorities. It, it has to be. Mm -hmm. I need to interrupt the podcast one more time. Did you know that We Make Footballers is a franchise business? We began franchising in 2015 and we now have over 60 franchises in operation across the UK, Dubai and US serving over 10,000 players. If you're a talented coach but don't want to start your own coaching business alone, visit franchisewmf.com to find out how We Make Footballers can help you operate a successful football coaching company. So I think that sometimes it's really hard for parents because they have this idea of what clubs are looking for because they will set up a lot of like 1v1 practices in academies and so then if the child is not successful at 1v1s then they can think oh my kid's not going to get signed and it is a factor like if if i, I mean like de bruyne like obviously he doesn't do that many like 1v1 moments in a game but I kind of think like when he was seven years old, he probably would have been good in a 1v1 situation against most kids that like he, he has like so much comfort on the ball. And so like in its rawest form of football for seven and eight year olds, they should be good at 1v1 situations and have good ability to create space with the ball and manipulate the ball. And, and that's important. But I think that as well as that, it, parents have to have a, a, a holistic program and not just be good in 1v1s with their kids. They also need to be starting to find coaching environments that are, that are developing like, you know, game understanding, positional play, um, you know, decision making, keeping possession. The, these, these things are so necessary for, for the way that the, the game is going. Exactly right. And and I think if we sort of break it down into onto the micro level, it's it's embedding that in the training session. So once again, a possession drill with no direction, five passes to score. And that encourages passing and moving. And then once you've done five passes, you can beat a beat a player one v one. But you're still there's still no direction. Mm. Just really that essence of football that we all love to see. You know, like 2011 Barcelona, even Inter Milan at phases this season, Man yeah. City, the way they play, it's like, yes, they have positions, but the way they move, it's like, that is like the natural way of football. I would say that's how every child wants to play. Well, that was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about today. I watched your video about Barcelona. Yeah. Did you say 2011 Barcelona? 2010-11, yeah. Yeah. That, that yeah. Yeah, and it's an amazing video. If you haven't watched it, go check it out. Um, for those that haven't seen the video, do you mind just briefly describing like what is in the essence of that video? Yeah, yeah. so I've, I've particularly highlighted Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta, Messi, and just the way, you know, they would come so close together just to play quick passes. And that goes against positional play. There's no, there's no strict play there. You could argue Pedro, David Villa, the wingers, their job was to stay high and wide to allow these four just to play freely. But then when they would stay high, they would get their reward because they would get that through ball because they've messy Nesta Shabby Busquets have dragged your position. But so I was just Um Raf, yeah. Raf, sorry, do you have your tactics board nearby? Uh I don't uh, uh oh, don't worry. It's fine, it's fine. Um I thought that would look good though, to sh literally show it on camera <laughs> to be able to show like what you're describing. If you give me like ten seconds, please, I'll just is that all right? If, if... Yeah, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all right. Yeah, we're all right. Um, I'm going to read some. I'm going to. Viewers leaving fast. <laughs> They're all right. They can hang on. 
Um, I'm going to see, just quickly read some comments. Um, my, my eyes are not the best, so it's hard for me to read these. Um, okay, yeah, that's making sense what people are saying. Oh, Coach Yuri's here. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. Oh, we've got, we've got Coach Raf with the tactics board. Come on. But, but the only yes. I'm not at home, so I don't have my uh, stand one this is the portable one because i've been traveling all day but <laughs> i knew you're gonna have you're gonna have a portable tactics board that you take with you love of course. it love it so um is it in general is it more comfortable if i develop it this way or that way usually it's um no the way you've got it is great we can see where the goalkeeper is um, okay if you're cool. if you're listening to this coach raf has got his famous tactic board out and he's now talking us through Barcelona 2010-2011. Get ready for a live masterclass. So, uh, I mean, yeah. So essentially, like, when, for example, Puyol or Piquet would have the ball, it's like Xavi, yes, they're in a triangle, Xavi, Busquets, Iniesta, but Xavi would play slightly deeper with Busquets. And uh, I, I said it in the video, what's very important is that they were on different lines. And I really encourage that at youth level as well, even non-league. Get yeah. your on slightly different lines. So Busquets would be slightly deeper, Abidal would be wider, and then Xavi would be there, Iniesta would go high, and then Messi would have the freedom just to operate wherever he wanted. And then it would just be ball circulation all day long, short intricate passes. We've mentioned La Pausa from Xavi, which is basically slowing the game down, waiting, waiting, waiting. And, you know, slowing the, slowing the game down could be in forms of playing slow passes, putting your foot on the ball, walking with the ball, uh, playing it out wide, you know. Um, and then essentially, the more they did that, Messi, Iniesta, Busquets, Xavi, they were playing intricate passes. And eventually, like Danny Alves would be high and wide, Pedro's there, they would release them. And then, you know, it, I don't know if that, is that the left side for you? Yeah, that's the left side for us. Okay, so, okay this is the right, I think it's flipped. But so that would be Abidal and David Villa, or it would be Danny Alves and Pedro. And I just think mm. it, there was so much freedom with the way they played that it's just like you just sit back and watch and you just enjoy your 90 minutes of football whether they won or lost um uh, and they, yeah and so and so um if in this in uh this positions that you've got up here with the barcelona side how many of this team were strong 1v1 players so, in, in attack, it would be Messi, Pedro, Villa, Dani Alves. Um, I, would, I would say Iniesta wasn't a 1v1, but he was more of a momentum player. So, if there's movement ahead of him, he would be able to like glide past players, or his first touch would let him go past the player. Mm. But in a, in a static 1v1, he didn't have the explosiveness that Pedro, David Villa, Messi, Dani Alves had. But, but he had like low center of gravity and he had such fast feet i mean they've named the iniesta shuffle after him yeah which he was able to do to get, to get past players so he would what does he say iniesta has have to be be this player i don't know what that person means by that but he, yeah like I'm, I'm just trying to understand for parents to understand to parents to be thinking about um helping their players to be the best that they can be and play for a future game. Like they're spending so much of their time, um, like learning to like get their players to dribble and be strong in a one v one situation. But then in this side, I suppose like Danny Alves, Messi. What what, what do you think about like Via, um, yeah. Pedro? Via Pedro as well. Like like by one v one, I mean if you isolate Pedro David Via in a one v one. Yeah. On the wing, they would all they would most of the time get past their player. But Iniesta would, I would say, he would be more effective at beating opponents when, let's say, they they pop the ball around. Then he with one touch he glides and then he just runs like yeah. that. So, yeah. but if Iniesta was isolated on the wing, yes, he could still beat his opponent. But in terms of effectiveness, I would lean more towards Pedro and, and David Villa. But like like overall, they would beat players through combination play because their first touch. It was it was so good that their first touch helped them so much. See, if if you were playing a team to counter them, yeah, 
like like is is in you're you're trying to um beat that Barcelona team and you're trying to think like tactically all right okay well if we go really really compact and we try and just suffocate Messi in here and and we try and suffocate all this passing that's going on with Xavi and Busquets and Iniesta well then you're going to leave those wide areas really exposed and yeah. that, that and that's obviously so dangerous because those players are so effective even like from wide areas, like they they would they would stay wide, wouldn't they? They would like constantly hug the line. Yeah, they would hug the line, knowing uh, and Pep Guardiola has said this countless times, knowing that the, like trusting their teammates to give them the ball in that one v one, or like but, yeah. But also creating space for Messi in the middle because let, let's yeah. say all right, let's say you don't if you don't go and mark them and you give them that space out wide, what happens then? Well. If you don't, it, if you, you don't go yeah. wide and you stay yeah, in the middle, you don't. You don't. You're, like, you're just like focusing just on defending against Messi, defend against Iniesta and Xavi. Just block the centre. But then Me like, Messi would just drift out very wide, as he has done. Yeah. With Danny, little combinations. Danny Alves would overlap. Pedro would come inside, and then they would just still do it. Or Messi's individual brilliance would just get them out of that. It's like yeah. it. it I mean, yeah, it was a very difficult team to stop just because of the individual ability. And that's where you could argue you could have a very good team tactically, but then individual ability just trumps all your tactics just because, like, if Messi gets it on the half turn and he just runs, like, how do you prepare for that? As as many managers have said before, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's so, so, like, uh, would you say, like, Barcelona, if that's, the like, the winning formula, would they be trying to re replicate that? Again and again and again. Uh, I just think it's hard to replicate because the, the plays they had, it, it's almost like once in a very long time that you would get that sort of a squad that would gel together. So having a player like Messi or having a player like Busquets who would run the games all day long, no matter which stadium he was in, it's just hard to find that player profile. But you could replicate that by bringing certain elements. For example, Midfielder on different lines, La Palza here and there, um, Busquets, reverse ball. So he would look this way and then Messi would be there and then he would just play there, break the line. Yeah. So you could get elements of that, yeah. But like clubs, you might want to just put the board down for a sec so we'll just talk this through um, together. So like clubs, clubs want to have dynasties. The way that like United just kept winning the Premier League just over and over and over again and the way that like Liverpool did it in the past and you know these, these that's what clubs would love to have it's what the fans want yeah. everything so but like to do that you've got I think I feel like Man City are kind of building a foundation that they're going to be able to do that year on year the, the only thing is that if Guardiola goes he's so important to the you know the whole program I don't know. Yeah, you just don't know if like they'll be able to keep it going without someone like Guardiola there. Exactly, and that's where when Guardiola left Barcelona, and they were still playing that same style of football. That's where you look at Barca's academy and all of those Spanish players that had graduated from the academy, and that club DNA has been embedded within them. So Busquets, Iniesta, Xavi, Messi, um, PK. When they've all Puyo, when they've all come from the academy, it's like the manager could leave, but it's just one identity, and that's where you know youth development is very important because Guardiola was also a La Masia product from the Barca academy, and you know yes, Xavi is the manager now, but because the players most of them haven't come from La Masia, that's where right now Barcelona are, are struggling. Yeah, but then why didn't they continue to produce players at that same level that they had in the in the past? But perhaps the demands of football got, got you know, in, increased physicality. Maybe Barcelona couldn't handle that extra, you know, phys physicality within the game, that athleticism that came with it. Because that Barcelona team physically weren't athletic monsters. They were, they were short, they were nimble. So we don't know if they can compete in today's game. Um, I just think because modern football is constantly evolving, it, it's just hard to guarantee that one formula will work next year the year after and the year after no but that's our job this is what me and you have got to work out yeah. 
we, yeah. we, we, <laughs> we, we, we've got to try and predict the future yeah. and then say, right, football is going to be like this in 10 years. So we need to recruit the players at a young age who, have, who can cope with those demands. And we need to give them the training and the tools to be able to go and play it. And then the parents need to understand that as well. So yeah. like, that's, that's the job of Project Footballer. We've we got, we got to do it. Uh, and that's where, once again, as we've spoken about earlier today, it's like we, we need to have the fundamentals. So if the fundamentals are in possession, play where the space is, then during the game we can adapt to potentially any developments that happen. But that base layer needs to be there. Mm. And that needs to be hardwired hard in you know, youth football. Guys, this is how we want to play. In possession, we do this. Out of possession, we do this. And then during the game, yes, you adapt. And as you develop through the years, yes, you adapt. You do certain things. But once again, that Barcelona DNA, there's that base layer. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And that's it. And I think that's what we need with what you're so, doing, that base layer. Okay, so let's just talk about ceilings now. So do you think that at that point for that, 2010 2011 period with that Barcelona there they basically reached a technical ceiling you're not going to get any better on the ball in terms of first touch speed of passing mm. dri dribbling ability and then also maybe like game understanding as well like game understanding and technique can humanity get any better than what we saw in 2011? Oh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, we brought you I, in to give us the answers. I would say yes. <laughs> I, I would say yes because um, like PK Puyol, I'm, I'm, I would say more, I would be more certain than not certain about what I'm going to say. Yeah. PK and Puyol would not be able to operate in midfield with their back to goal. So actually, we haven't reached that. We did not reach that stage with with that oh, Barca team. Fine. Okay. Okay. So, so there's a bit of opportunity for technical. Um, there's a technical ceiling there. Um, there's more. There's more technical opportunities to develop. What about athletic ceilings? Yeah, I, I would say they weren't. They did not reach the athletic ceilings in terms of like pure speed, vertical running on a counter attack. And often La Liga teams, I remember watching a few games where La Liga teams would sit back because Dani Alves and Abidal pushed that wide, ball into the channel, and then Barca would get exposed because PK Puyol weren't the fastest. So athletically, they did not reach, they, 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 yeah, they, they did not reach their season. So is that where then, let's, let's go with this thought experiment and this theory that Barcelona... And like, if Rob Ertel was on this podcast, he'd be just arguing with me now. Like, he'd just say, no, Sean, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. Like, let's go with it. Um, so maybe the athleticism kicked on um, and, and like clubs did start like, you know, recruiting more athletic players and putting more demands on their players athletically. And so then where Barcelona kind of stayed the same to say, well, this is what we produce all these years and it's always worked for us. We're going to keep producing that over and over again. But then gradually, their youth players weren't able to come through to play at that level, and which has meant they've had to buy and just, yeah, keep buying uh, uh, to, to have players that, that can play to the Champions League level or, you know, yeah. the top. Yeah, do you think that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where that, that club DNA in the modern game moving forward needs to be a certain level of athleticism, 100%. The game's becoming faster. Guardiola said himself, I wouldn't be able to compete in today's modern game. Did he? <laughs> yeah. So he, he's, he's known himself. He's seen it. Like his physicality wasn't the greatest. He would be, you know, he would struggle in today's game. So he would have base layer, technical proficiency, athletic proficiency, and then tactical proficiency. And then from there, you just, yeah. But like the 100 meter time, it's like, what is it? Nine point something now. Five eight. But it's only... Right, okay. Um, I knew you'd know that. <laughs> and so, um, like, if it's like increase, like it's decreased over the past like ten years, it's been splits of seconds. Mm. You know, like tiny, tiny milliseconds of seconds. So, like, humans can only get so much faster. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, 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 yeah. So, are we starting to reach now 
athletic ceilings yes yeah so just because you see a lot of teams prioritizing that that, that gym routine and yeah. that fitness routine in pre-season i just think in the previous generations like Zinedine Zidane, Andrea Perlo, Sergio Busquets, they weren't the most athletic players. So oh, yeah. it goes back to that point. You look at Declan Rice, he's able to really sprint vertically and horizontally. Yeah. And yeah. and some would argue like Jorginho at Arsenal struggles. He can't last the whole game yeah. because of his legs. So I think that athleticism has to be prioritised because it's it's the game's but, becoming faster and faster. I, I get you, I get you. But what I'm asking is that have we now reached a ceiling I think there could still be more room for improvement whereby we look at a lineup and we're like, everyone's fast. There's no weak link in terms of speed. So right now you could look at a lineup and say, look, we're going to target him. He's not the fastest. Let's put a winger on him. Done. But they might reach a point where <laughs> you, you can't beat teams for speed. You have to beat them with this instead. Mm. Th that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, do you, do you think it will be... I wonder how they'll balance height. Like, if you could literally pick to have, you know, if, if you're playing FIFA, and, you know, we've probably all done it, where you make your team, like, giants, and you make them, like, 99 speed and 99 strength and all that kind of thing, you do pick them all to be super tall, if you can. can. Yeah. So, from from a recruitment point of view... Should we be looking out for tall kids if we can? If we can, I would argue because then once again the uh, the flip side is if you're short, you have your low center of gravity, you're able to turn quicker. So then it comes to the point where you say which player would occupy, you know, certain positions most often, and which height complements that. So a center back, I'm looking at height to head the ball. Uh, midfield who will be there most often if we're going down the route of okay play where the space is a midfielder would most likely occupy that whole central area so then i'm looking at potentially we could get a shorter player you know a taller player it, but I would, I would i would always prioritize the technical ability over height because you, you could i think you could work around height more than working around a lack of technical ability yeah but you just said a moment ago that managers would target a player who isn't quick yeah. And the same thing, like, players, I mean, Chelsea, they gave away that goal in the last minute against Van Dijk in the Carabao Cup recently because Van Dijk was taller than everyone in the box. Like, having short players, it does give you a vulnerability there. If you can get yourself to be where the whole team are super technical, but, but yeah, I guess that players like Jude Bellingham are quite rare yeah. because, uh -huh. like you say, if you're shorter you do have that advantage with low centre of gravity and you're able to be more agile and it's easier for you to learn technique um, as, a, as a shorter person. Exactly. And then, but, but then you look at Bellingham, he's able to still, you know, turn over a short, like he's able to quickly turn. He's very nimble and quick. So then you're looking at ideally, yeah, ideally, if you could have everyone at that height with that technical ability. But I think we're, we're talking more like the perfect team, which, which is... Almost yeah, yeah. impossible to find. But but no, but like we've got how many people? What is how many people are like four billion people play football I or like it, are football fans or something like that? Like we're we're, we're getting so much better in our recruitment. Um, you're you're literally able to you you know there's not it's not impossible to think like this that you could be able to like get your perfect footballers from a young age because technique is so teachable. And game understanding is so teachable. So it's like, yeah, yeah, like you then are saying, all right, well, if we can get the perfect athletes that we want, if we, if we understand the perfection that we're looking for, for like a winning formula, then it then helps us then understand like what to then pick from the bottom. Yeah, I, you've given me something very interesting to, to think about on my way back home because okay. I, I've never prioritised the um, height aspect. Yes, speed, um, strength, but height, I, I've always said technique, you know, t t tactics, speed, agility, physicality, but I've actually never thought about the height bit. That, that's I, interesting, I, yeah. I, I, I guess it's different because, well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you were, if you 
had access to what the perfect blend of players that you wanted, but but still probably Guardiola wouldn't pick a whole team of like super tall players because it's just so unrealistic that you're going to be able to get players with the the technique that you want and the game yeah. understanding that you want because there's this thing called like um, the it's like something to do with like the David Goliath complex. Okay. I, I've kind of maybe butchered it, but the idea is that you develop your strength because of your weaknesses. Often you'll find very physical players that struggle with technique and game understanding because they've become successful in football because they've relied on their strength. And then the other side of it is you'll often have smaller players that are referred to as technicians yeah. because they've had to be effective by being skillful and clever and then that's the only way that they can be effective in the game so they double down on that skill so then that ends up happening at the top of the game where you'll get these clever small players and technical small players and then yeah vice versa with physical players um that's kind of like a really sort of like common train of thought that is talked about in like recruitment I see. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so like you know, if you're out there like Guardiola, and he knows that he wants for his attacking players that they are clever, they're they're creative, they're super technical, they can play in tight spaces. Chances are he's going to be using shorter players. That that if you look at the stats in recent years for the top te- like four te- teams in the Premier League. Um, the, the attacking players have become like shorter and shorter in in recent years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really common. And like the last World Cup, sorry, you're about to speak. No, no. Uh, just one of the exceptions would be like ha- Haaland, <laughs> who's who's a almost like a like the ultimate footballer in terms of height, speed, and power. Yeah. But but that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, nines are often tall. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but um, the the the, the wide players, the players that play in those like high attacking positions in midfield, yeah, that in the top teams, they're often shorter players be- because they're having to break down low blocks and play in these like, really, really like tight pockets. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's very interesting hearing your perspective on kind of the direction. I feel yeah. that we still have only scratched the surface of it. Yeah, honestly. Uh, yeah, be- just because, once again, if, if football moves in the way it has been for the next 10 years, they might reach technical ceilings. OK, we have comfort everywhere. We've reached tactical ceilings. Players are able to adapt. But what about the height? And then it could be, OK, can we find taller players? Because then if we have taller players, maybe we can go to a next level, aerial duels, we can win flick-ons if, if things aren't working out on the floor. So it, it, it is very interesting. What about psychological ceilings? I would always, th- yeah, with psychological, I just think there would, it's hard to say that there will ever be a ceiling because every player has their own previous experiences uh, as a human being, more so than a footballer. So a player could miss an open goal, feel angrier and then score a hat-trick. Another player could miss an open goal and then just shy away from the game. It's It's... I would say physical, uh, a psychological ceiling is much harder to to attain if if you were able to attain it. Because how do we categorize a ceiling of uh, psychologically? How, how would we? Mm. I, I mean, I don't know how psychologists give scorings for yeah. players yeah. in like you know their their mental feedback. Um, their I can you think you'd say like you know a player's resilience, their attitude <laughs> at training, their positivity. Um, their well-being scores they give themselves. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. but, but I guess that more and more clubs will be investing in this, like having more psychologists, they'll have more experience, more data to call upon. Th- they'll be getting support from artificial intelligence. Um, I think they'll be like able to like n- keep track of more of the players. Like, yeah, my- Mindsets. I, I don't know if they'll they'll be able to do some sort of like um, bio testing as yeah. well. Like imagine yeah. that they can then yeah like you know take blood samples and then look at the like blood levels and then say oh yeah you know there's a chemical imbalance and maybe that's to do with their like mindset. 
So that, you know, they start then getting onto all the psychologists and saying, you're not getting our players to be like, you know, in the right headspace. Um, and, and then like creating, like removing, removing variables, like, you know, the, as trying to get the same coach company to be like taking the players to games, um, controlling their sleep, controlling like just so much. There'll be so many more controls in place that that could close the gap on yes yeah, psychological ceilings yeah it could but it's just it's hard because you know a player at the age of six years old could have been very aggressively shouted at by their parent mm, after right. doing something and then it's like i've seen a study where whatever happens between four to eight years old stays for a long time if there's a big trauma so how do you you can't it's very difficult to er eradicate that unless the player himself or herself really works psychologically to sort of walk past that barrier yeah but think that the money that's in football and yeah that they'll start to become like therapists at clubs from a like young age and then they'll start to then coach players like they'll have these therapy sessions and maybe they'll start working on some of these traumas like earlier than maybe they've done in the past maybe yeah potentially and then it's just difficult because everyone's life like on, on a daily basis it's hard to mm -hmm. control what happens there uh, a parent could pass away before the cup mm -hmm. final and it's like whoa what do you do mm -hmm. so so that psychological ceiling ideally you would say okay the player would play the same irrespective of you know what happens in their family life and then you're sort of going more towards robots well right? that, that's the direction we're going um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, very well, interesting. Because they just the money is driving people to want to have the controls in place of football. They want it to be as controlled as possible. So, yeah, like you know, this is this is the direction. Um, all right, final one: social, social ceilings. Where are we at? I would say there's a lot, lot of development to be done with that, just because by social do you mean the player interaction that changing room environment that team environment exactly yeah that the ability for a player to socialize with their coaches socialize with their their teammates that's obviously a big part of the game those relationships it's a team game so how have we reached a ceiling there and how much that can improve with clubs <laughs> I think that can improve a lot because, first of all, we have to define what is the optimal social environment. And Postacoglu at Tottenham said he doesn't want to create a close relationship with his players, so he doesn't really talk to them a lot about their personal life. That's one spectrum. Mourinho is the type of player, I think he went to his player's house once, or I've heard some interesting stories where he would just knock on the door, yeah, let's have a dinner together. <laughs> so it's like every... It's just when you talk about human management, human interactions, it's it's very hard to pin it down to one thing because as a player, I would prefer my coach to put his arm around me and say, oh, how's your personal life? Some players would say, no, as long as he plays me, I'm happy. I, I, I couldn't care less. It's just the, the expectations are, are different. So would we reach a psychological and social ceiling ever? At the moment, I, I would say no, but as you said, with the money and everything, I would still well, say no, because it's human management. It's I get you, um, but I, I had a really good conversation with the head of recruitment who told me that the club, mm, let me be careful how I phrase this without giving stuff away. Um, I'll take this back a step. So I'm aware that at clubs, data is becoming a lot more involved at every level of the game. So clubs will be profiling their players to try and understand the type of characters that they are then like you see how in fifa there's the connections where they can see like how clubs are all connected in your chemistry yeah so so yeah, then yeah, yeah so, so like that is starting to happen at top level like they are putting data points on characters and then they're then saying well, we've got this blend of these profiles in our team. Is this the perfect chemistry balance that we need? Do we have enough leaders in here? Do we have 
enough introverts uh, what what is the balance that we've got yeah like you know that is yeah, interesting so, Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because then they then they then analyze. And some of this is subjective, but they're trying to bring data into it now. So then they then will go through like past teams and try and like put data points against like past teams and say, right, well, we got these outcomes, and so then we had these characters and this balance. How can we replicate that again? Do we have too many leaders in the group? Do we oh. have not enough leaders? Do we? Yeah. So so that because we bring it back to like what we will what we say people want to have a dynasty they want to be able to say that every year we're going to have these results and try and control the process so then combining that with data it then will affect like what they do in the transfer market because they say yeah typically when we look at our perfect group and what we're aspiring for this would be it and so that's where yeah they're not just saying technical psychological physical it's like even going into social as well which it's not it's so that crazy is, that is Isn't crazy it? just because it I've, I've never really thought that you can reach a threshold as you've spoken about with regards to literally managing human beings yeah. just because <laughs> yeah. because like you, you could have a 27 year old a 21 year old a 24 year old that's 20 20 20 years 20 plus years of so many events happening in each person's respective life. So to, to pin it down to one sentence and say, this is what we want, I just find it very, very difficult. Especially, I've just mentioned three ages. There's 18, 20, 20 players in a squad plus staff. It's like... <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. And obviously, the people understand that there's going to be some parts of the game that can't be controlled uh, as well as other parts can be controlled but what i'm describing is that the efforts are there the attempts are there and nothing is off the table oh. and everything is wanting to be able to be measured and yeah involved with like data um but yeah it's that's interesting it's, that's um, honestly very very interesting yeah 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 it's why it's why i love i, I like football is so amazing because you can look at a football team that's playing so well on the pitch and you can see how much goes into getting these players to be able to play well. There's so many teams of people that are working every day to make this happen. And, and the teams that succeed are just like super well-run businesses and organizations. Wow. And then the, the results that happen on the pitch, you know, that's just a lag effect of all the great work that's been happening that creates that moment that the fans obviously we all see and enjoy uh, and right. like the game right. today yeah it's just so it's um, just it's just become more than just uh, a 90 minute game it honestly has <laughs> that's it that's it <laughs> well um Raf, thank you very much like we try to keep these ones an hour episode and we've gone a bit over time because i think you know it's a great conversation i loved hearing from you um, again, I say the same thing that I said last time, you know, speaking to you, we just scratched the surface. We've got more to learn from you. Um, I hope that we can, yeah, speak again. I think we're going to get good feedback from this. There's been like loads of hearts happening through our conversation, which is so nice. Um, yeah, you know, thank you to everyone that like joins these episodes. Like it's very motivating for, for me and, and I'm sure for you, Raf, like you know, when, when you're, yeah, when we're seeing people that, are appreciating some of what we're able to share. Yeah, it's um, you know, very motivating to want to keep doing more and like you know, keep for, for us to keep improving our knowledge so we have things to share. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, I you know, it's, it's enjoyable. Like yeah, um, connecting with you all. Um, any any closing words from you, Raf? Yeah, just wanted to say yeah, thank you for having me on. Honestly, I didn't even register the fact that it's been more than one hour because when when I start talking <laughs> about football. Yeah. I lose track of time. Um, but yeah, honestly, thank you to anyone who watched this. And my best message is to keep studying the game. If you're interested in that spectrum, if you don't like studying the game, play the game. You know, yeah. there's always a way uh, to, to, to find enjoyment within the game of football. I like, <laughs> like that. I like that. And for those people listening to this or watching this afterwards on YouTube, I've said at the start of the episode, you need to follow Coach Raf top guy you'll learn from every one of his videos please make sure you follow him and yeah we'll def definitely be having him back on another episode soon appreciate that Sean. Well, thank you all very right much. nice one see ya cheers thank bye. you bye